I was intrigued by this when I was researching my first book because I thought, can this be linked in some way to precognition? Because the voice is clearly precognitive. What does this mean? And then I started researching on near-death experience. And some of the things about near-death experience intrigued me. And one of the particular areas of near-death experience that intrigued me was something called a panoramic life review. It's one of the moody traits. That there is a series of traits that are actually doctors use to, to analyze a near-death experience. You know, the going towards the light, the floating out of the body, etc. But the, 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 the panoramic life review is one of the, the, the major typologies. I thought to myself, if I have a, if in the final moments of my life, my life flashes before my eyes, that suggests that my life has been recorded, doesn't it? How else can that happen? I know that I can't remember my own childhood. I have flashes of my childhood. We have flashes, flash memories. They're actually called charged memories that we have of our childhood. And again, it's odd, isn't it? If you look back to your childhood, the things you remember in your childhood are not necessarily the time you were told when your grandmother died. It would be something tactile, like remember, remembering touching a piece of fur or, or a particular stormy day or being in your pram. It's as if certain memories, are, are, as if it's a recording and certain parts of the recording mechanism are super saturated to make that memory more powerful. But if it is the case that our brain records our whole life, can it be proven? Can it be shown? I believe it can. This is a guy called Wilder Penfield. And Wilder Penfield was a, an, a Canadian neurosurgeon. And Penfield's younger sister had died through complications due to inoperable epilepsy. And what Penfield wanted to do was to find a way of operating and knowing which parts of the brain had the problems with epilepsy, because you probably know epilepsy is a storm in the brain. So it starts in one point of the brain called the focus, and it spreads out like a forest fire across the brain. If it crosses the corpus callosum, which is the thing that joins the two hemispheres of the brain into the, the other hemisphere, you black out, you have a grand mal seizure. But he realized that if you can stop the storm starting, you can actually localize it. And what he did was, he thought, well, there's a mechanism why you could do this. If you can find where it starts in the brain, you can actually cut round the, the brain matter around where it starts, rather like um, firemen, if there's a forest fire. They will cut a trench with water or sand in it to localize the fire. He thought, if you can find the part of the brain where the, the temple, where the seizure starts, you can isolate it. The problem was, this is pretty radical surgery, so you needed to know what parts of the brain did what, because you couldn't start cutting bits out of somebody's brain willy-nilly, because you could damage them. So what he did was, he did a series of operations, whereby he, he, he took a part of the skull out of a patient. Now, you may or may not be aware, but the skull feels pain, but the brain doesn't. So effectively, you can give local anaesthetic to the skull and the scalp, and you can cut out a part of the skull and then you can manipulate the brain of a conscious patient. And the reason this is effective is, it means if you have an electrode, you can place it on exposed areas of the brain, and you can ask the person what they're experiencing. Okay? And what his plan was, that he would map the brain. And what he did was he worked his way systematically through the brain. Now, this is one of his examples taken from one of his books. And as you can see, when the, exposed, when the brain was exposed, they put numbers on the sections of the brain and then they, they asked the person what that evoked in them. They worked their way around the brain and the various parts of the brain till they got to the temporal lobes, which are the areas around the ear. When they got to the temporal lobes and he placed the electrode onto the exposed temporal lobes of these patients, many of them immediately had past life memories. Some of them had three-dimensional past life memories where they were literally back in a time in their past. On one occasion, he placed the electrode on an exposed brain of a woman and she was back in her kitchen, in her house, 20 odd years before. And she said she was actually there. She could hear the conversation of her next door neighbors across the fence. She then hears her son call. So what Penfield did was he, he distracted her. He took the electrode off. She said, oh dear, what did you do? It stopped. So he distracted her and asked her about her son, what her son was doing. 
While she was distracted, he placed the electrode back on the same point of the brain and she turned around and said, what have you just done? I'm back there again, back in her kitchen. Penfield reproduced this many, many times in his career and he became convinced that the human brain remembers everything. It's encoded within the brain, probably using something like holography. Because one of the major issues you'll find, if you look in brain science, you'll find that the one major problem has been the location of the engram, the location of where memory is in the brain. Uh, a guy called Paul Carl Lashley spent most of his career trying to find the location of memories in the brain. The reason they've not been able to find memories in the brain is because another guy called Carl Pribram uh, of Georgetown University came along and suggested that memories work holographically. And as you know, a hologram has all the information across the whole field. So therefore, the, the brain's memories work holographically either within the brain or somewhere else. So that's why you'll never find memories. But it does seem that memories have some kind of location within the temporal lobes. And they think the reason, behind, the reason for this is behind the temporal lobes uh, are, are, are smaller areas of the brain that have associations with emotion. And they think this is how it works. So we had one person under peculiar circumstances who could actually remember the past. But there is one guy um, called Solomon Sharonevsky who remembered everything in his life. In fact, he had been um, a memory man in Russia in the 1920s and he's earned, he earned his living by going around Russia doing shows with memories. The problem was he couldn't, he couldn't get rid of the memories. The memories were there all the time. Now imagine how difficult that would be that you remember every single thing of your life. Your brain is full of all this nonsense, so you can't really function. So one day, Sharonevsky turned up at the doorstep of this guy here, Alexandra Luria, who was a top psychiatrist in Moscow, and he said, can you do something about my memory, please? It's driving me crazy. Sharonevsky couldn't do anything, but he studied this guy for a few years, and he wrote an amazing book, which I suggest you read, called Mind of a Memnonic, Memnonist. And it's about Sharonevsky's phenomenal memory. But one of the things that Sharonevsky said to Luria intrigued me. He turned round and he said, I think the reason I remember everything is because of my illness. He never really discusses his illness in great detail, but I checked up on this. His illness was epilepsy. His illness was epilepsy located or focused on his temporal lobes. So clearly here we have a link with memory and temporal lobe epilepsy, epilepsy focused in the temporal lobes. Does anybody know the work of my vague namesake, Kim Peek, the, the Rain Man, the guy that Rain Man was based upon, who lived in Salt Lake City? He died about three or four years ago. The guy that um, Tom Cruise and the guy, the guy that was in the film took him off. This guy had such a memory, Kim Peek forgot nothing. Not only that, when he was bored, and he visited a town, he used to get hold of the telephone directories and add up all the numbers. He'd go down the list and add them all up, and he was always right. He could read three books at the same time. He could mirror read. He could read two books, and he could mirror read. He couldn't tie his own shoelaces. He, again, had temporal lobe epilepsy. So clearly, there is something with this temporal lobe epilepsy, and I wanted to know more about it. I am going somewhere with this, by the way, in case you're wondering, and it is linked to near-death experience. This is a picture painted by a temporal lobe epileptic, uh, part of a scheme by a guy called Dr. Stephen Schachter in New York. What is this epileptic trying to get across here? They feel there's somebody else in their head. They're trying to get the picture, an idea of duality. And I started to think when I was looking at near-death experience, I was thinking, hold on a minute, there's a link here. Temporal lobe epileptics think there's a feeling of duality. They also seem to feel that they know the future. And the reason they know this is, and if anybody knows or experiences temporal lobe epilepsy in the audience, you'll know precisely what I'm going to say now. Before you have a pre, before you have a seizure, if indeed you do have a full seizure, you'll have something called the aura. And the aura, one of the main themes of the temporal lobe epilepsy aura, is deja vu sensations, profound deja vu sensations. It's as if you know what's going to happen next. I'm a classical migrainer, and I get this to a lesser extent sometimes. So it's clearly linked neurologically. It's as if you can see the future. You know you've lived this time before. So I started looking into TLE. And I found some fascinating things about people. 
throughout history. Great writers, because there's hundreds and hundreds of people throughout history that supposedly had temporal lobe epilepsy. Many of them claimed that they were two people. I'll give some examples, I'm aware of time here, but I'll give one or two examples here. This is Fyodor Dostoevsky, Russian writer. If any of you have read any Fyodor Dostoevsky, the one thing you'll find is he has two preoccupations. One preoccupation he had is doubles or doppelgangers. Book after book, he discusses doppelgangers. He's also preoccupied with another phenomenon, time slowing down. He's also preoccupied with, with the mysteries of life. These are all things that temporal lobe epileptics have. Something called Gershwin syndrome that they have, where they see links, they're hyper-religious. They're very, very deep. A lot of religious leaders throughout history have been diagnosed as having temporal lobe epilepsy. And this is because of the way they see the world. I'm now in contact with literally dozens and dozens of temporal lobe epileptics from around the world. They all reinforce this. They usually contact me because they'll say, you're the first person that's ever written about how I feel about my illness. And all of them feel there's somebody else in their mind. Um, the guys down the bottom here uh, are Emile and Jules Goncourt, the French realist, paint, uh, realist writers. Emile Goncourt was asked about life, and he said, life is a nothing between two epileptic seizures. Now bear that in mind as we move on, because that was a profoundly important statement. So clearly there must be something linked here with the brain, something linked with the way the brain functions. Those of you who attended my last lecture will probably can go to sleep now, in case if you haven't already. But it's the structures of the brain I'm now intrigued in. What is this telling us about the structures of the brain? And I believe there's something intriguing happening here. As you probably know, your brain is full of neurons, brain cells. You have billions of brain cells in your brain. None of the brain cells touch. They have what's called a synaptic gap. And the synaptic gap, which is this thing here, depending upon what signal is going across the brain, depends on what chemical is released. Now, the interesting thing about certain times during our life, there's a particular neurochemical that is known to be released in times of stress and, and death. It's called glutamate. Glutamate is the major neurotransmitter chemical of the mammalian brain. It functions and it helps memory, it helps a lot of things, and it's particularly focused on the temporal lobes. But the one thing about glutamate, if there's too much of it, it causes excitotoxicity. It actually kills brain cells. So when you're in great times of stress and the glutamate is released, there are other drugs released in your brain to actually cut down the glutamate. This is what happens when you have a shock or you're involved in a car crash or an accident. I'm sure that members of the audience here have had the experience of time slowing down when you've had an accident, you've been in a car crash. That's the glutamate or the effects of the glutamate in the brain. What is a known fact is that glutamate floods the brain at the point of death. Now bear that in mind as well. So we have these neurotransmitters within the brain, and within the neurotransmitter, within the, 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 the structures of the brain, and within the neurons of the brain, are other very, very small structures called microtubules. And there are literally billions of microtubules in every single neuron. So therefore, there are trillions of microtubules in your brain, the little kind of structures of protein. Now, what is intriguing about these structures of protein it's work being done by Professor Roger Penrose and Dr. Stuart Hammerhoff. Stuart Hammerhoff is an anesthesiologist at the University of Arizona. Again, as I always say to my, pe my people when they come to my talks, don't take my word for this, check this out. You know, just check it out to see if, whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Hammerhoff is an anesthesiologist. He is fascinated as to how anesthetics work. Because whatever doctors tell you, they haven't got a clue how anesthetics work. They know which anesthetics work, but they don't know why. They don't know why an anaesthetic, when you take it, makes your consciousness completely disappear and then come back again. They have no idea why that happens. Hammerhoff is interested in this and he believes it's to do with the microtubules. Professor Roger Penrose is the, is the, the Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge and he's also a theoretical physicist. These guys both argue that there's something peculiar happening within the microtubules of the brain. The microtubules of the brain are intriguing because they give off pulses of light, pulses of electromagnetic radiation. These pulses go from either side of the microtubule 
And the waves of the light interfere with each other. They call, cause interference patterns. Now, if there's any group of people in the audience that know about holograms, that's what holograms are. They're interference patterns. Now, let's think about this. If your brain contains trillions and trillions of these tiny little things, they're all called all generating tiny little micro, uh, tiny little holograms. Is that where memory comes from? In fact, is this what this is? Your brain is generating this reality from the holograms being drawn up within your brain. Of course, the question is, where's this information coming from? Where do these, where do these bio photons come from? And they believe the latest theories are suggesting that the bio photons are related to mini black holes. Uh, Stephen Hawking has postulated that the universe is full of tiny, tiny black holes. As you know, a black hole is an area of gravitation where it's so dense in its mass that even light can't escape. If these are everywhere, it means they're in your brain. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of them in your brain now, at this moment. If that is the case then, they create what's called wormholes. And wormholes are, are literally breaks in space where information can come from one part of the universe to another. Again, I can't go into detail on this, but effectively the technical term for these is Einstein-Rosen bridges. So, the information then in turn is drawn up from something called the Bose-Einstein condensate. Bose-Einstein condensates are very, very peculiar plasma-like structures in which subatomic particles act like a single particle. Because, again, I can't go into detail here, I do another talk on this about how quantum physics works, how it really functions, rather than how the New Age people would like it to believe. But the actual fact of the matter is, is that subatomic particles, there's a point where behaviour of subatomic particles stops being weird and becomes normal. Okay? But Bose-Einstein condensates, because there are a group of particles all acting as one particle, Bose-Einstein condensates can actually have an effect in the Newtonian universe, the universe we exist within. Both einstein condensates, I argue, are actually functioning within the microtubules of the brain, which means subatomic behaviours can actually be drawn up. And the subatomic behaviours and the information it is, sits in something called zero-point energy. It was touched upon earlier on today. Zero-point energy is supposedly, um, from the research that's been done, and there's very, very strong evidence that, it, that this stuff actually exists, is, is a whole field of information that actually fills the vacuum of space. It's also called vacuum energy. And it's everywhere, it fills everywhere. Space is not a vacuum, it's the complete opposite, it's a plenum. Now, if anybody's interested on this, uh, in August I will be doing a web webinar with Professor Irvin Laszlo and Professor De, um, Bernard Haish. And Bernard Haish is an astrophysicist who has a grant from the American government to be researching zero-point energy as a, as, a, as a source of energy, okay? So this is the real deal, this stuff. Both sides, zero-point energy is an energy field. And being a field, it can process information, it contains information. Irvin Laszlo has suggested not only does it contain information, it contains all information. That's where everything is contained and it's all digitized within the zero point field. Laszlo calls it something else, he calls it the Akashic field. Have anybody heard of the Akashic record and the idea of somewhere that actually contains everything? There is an idea at the basic level of reality, there is something that contains everything. This is the computer program by which reality runs. Okay? So, what I'm actually saying here is that this is a loop of how I think all this works. And it, we go down to microtubules, both sides, and bring you up from zero point energy. But this is then uploaded into the brain, which generates the external world as a, a, some form of illusion. And then we come down here to the outer body experience, which a lot of us have experienced in times, and the near death experience. And I'll show you how this works now. This is the cheating the ferryman hypothesis. There's that picture again, by the way, Alex Gray. How this process works, I think at the point of death something very strange happens in the brain. And I use this analogy. Here's a skydiver. And the thing about this skydiver is he's done something very stupid. He's forgotten his parachute. So there's going to be a point where he's about to hit the ground, isn't he? At that point, the glutamate flood hits. 
or what I'm now suggesting is more complex than that because I think the glutamate flood generates something called dimethyltryptamine in the brain. Dimethyltryptamine, we were talking some we earlier, we were talking about ayahuasca. And of course, the main constituent of ayahuasca is dimethyltryptamine. Most powerful hallucinogenic drug known to man. It's known to be in the brain, it's known to be in the blood, it's known to be in virtually everything. And people will turn around and say, there's no evidence that DMT is in the brain. And I say to people, look up the research on something called the TARS receptors, which was about five or six years ago. I won't go into detail about that, but they're called the TAARS, the trace amines. We know that DMT is in the brain. DMT is released, and the strange thing that what happens with DMT, people who've taken it will tell you this, time slows down. Suddenly, time, a split second, can be hours, years, a lifetime. On top of that, you start getting memories of your past life generated, drawn up from the zero point field. If that's the case, he's never going to hit the ground, is he? Because his time is not your time anymore. You can see him crash into the ground in your time, but in his time, he survives. And what does he do when he survives? He actually has his whole, whole life projected. He lives his life again effectively in a three-dimensional recreation of his life. He's in a computer game. He's in a computer simulation. And at that point of time, he splits into two. He splits into something I call the Eidolon, which is what most of us are in the room, which are, which are creatures living your life in a linear fashion from your birth to your death in linear time, drawing up information from the zero point field. Whereas the daemon, who's the other part, suddenly is your universal self. It's your self that remembers your past lives. It's your self that knows you're living your life again. That is the voice in the head. That's the thing that warns you. That's your higher spirit. If some of you are mediums in the room, it's your spirit guide. This is what is happening. You are your own guide. And it works like a computer game. The zero point field is like a CD-ROM that has every single outlook, outcome of every single decision you can make in your life encoded in it. Which means, if you know what you're doing, you can live any potential life you could possibly live, which is your life. Lara Croft on the screen when you're playing Blade Runner, uh, playing Blade Runner, playing uh, Tomb Raider, as far as she is concerned, she only has one life. She runs down a corridor, she gets eaten by the monster. As far as the game player is concerned, she has dozens of lives, as many lives as he wants, because he knows what's going to happen and he can avoid the accident she had last time. This is what happened, or what Errol May Jones' Damon tried to do and failed in this universe, but in another universe would have succeeded. And this, of course, is the idea of the Boovy Groundhog Day. And in case if anybody's interested, I interviewed the guy who wrote Groundhog Day, Danny Rubin, a few weeks ago on one of my radio stations. And it's stopped there on the web if you want to hear it. By the way, Danny is, my first book is The Life After Death. Danny has given to all his associates at Harvard. He said, this guy's done the science of the movie. Groundhog Day. My overall hypothesis has now been developed over a series of years and as you can see here the first book now has been published in various foreign languages as well so it's starting to get out there into the real world. The three books on the, the four books on the side of the books I've already written and the two books The Infinite Minefield will be taking my ideas forward into the future with my new ideas and I've also written an autobi autobiography, a biography of Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction writer, applying my hypothesis to his life with his daemon and everything else. Let's go back to the model here. And what I'm trying to explain here is how the feedback works and the feedback loop. So we have an effective feedback loop, and I'll try and explain what I mean by this here. Is that you have the human brain with consciousness inside it. Whatever you are, you're inside your, you know, whether you're inside your brain or outside your brain is a moot point. But there is something inside your brain or there is something that is manifest within your brain from somewhere else, which you call me or I. And that's the being that you are throughout your life, okay? Now, one of the major problems of modern neurology and modern science is something called the hard problem. The hard problem was put forward by an Australian uh, philosopher called David Chalmers. And what Chalmers is saying is that how can effectively inanimate matter with electrical stimuli and electrical signals going through it create the concept of a self-referential human being? Because every single person in this room, you have hopes, you have dreams, you have memories, you have anticipations. 
That is impossible within known science. You can take the brain apart piece by piece, but you will not find consciousness. You will find evidence of consciousness with an MRI scan and other things, but you will not find the location of consciousness or how consciousness is generated by the brain. So that's the hard problem. Modern science isn't even close to explaining that. So we have to think of something more revolutionary to explain exactly what it is that's taking place either within the brain or how the brain is working as a receiver. Okay, so we'll go through the feedback loop as I see it. So what we have here is you have your brain and there's the ex supposed external world. That is the external world of phenomenon that is outside, that is presented to you through your senses. In other words, you're now looking at me, you are seeing me, you are seeing everything through electromagnetic radiation, through vibrations in your ears, which are actually being converted into electrical, sim uh, electrical impulses, which go through your brain, and somehow, magically, you create internally this external world. Now, remember two or three things I'd like to point out. You're now seeing me and everything in this room that is being created from a little inverted image the size of a postage stamp on your retina. It's upside down and it's warped. Yet your brain can take that information and turn it into the three-dimensional surround visual world that you perceive. That is a magic trick beyond phenomenal. It is unbelievable how it does that. It's also unbelievable how you have a feeling of simultaneity with everything. The sounds are coming in at a different speed to your, to, to your eyesight. The posi positions of your body is working in a different way. Again, if you ever want to get neurologists panic-stricken, mention something called the binding problem. How it all comes together in the brain. But somehow, there is something processing the external world within your head. What they believe is processing it is all these little cells in your brain called neurons. Okay, and as I pointed out before, the neurons inside them have these structures called microtubules. As I mentioned, each, mi each microtubule is, is firing out things called biophotons, bits of electromagnetic energy. Now this is internal light, and this is the, what I'll be dealing with in my next book. If you close your eyes now, or when you're at home and you're in the dark, and you press the corner of your eyes, you'll actually see light. And people will turn around and say, well, you're seeing light because it's pressing upon the nerves in the eye. Yeah, that's pressing on the nerves of the eye. It's not creating photons. So there must be an internal light that your brain can generate. That internal light, they've actually discovered now, they're called biophotons. Biophotons are little form, little bits of energy that literally come up from DNA. DNA itself creates light. Is that the light you see when you dream? Because of course the great mystery is, when you dream you have a visual experience. Blind people, when they have near-death experiences, see again. Sometimes even when they've not ever seen anything, they see the world. So there's this inner light. Where does this inner light come from? I suggest that it's actually coming up from the microtubules in your brain. So the microtubules, as I say, create very, very tiny holograms.